Uh, my name is Ted Varani. I am head of business development for Scientific Revenue. Um, we, uh, just a little bit who we are, we do dynamic pricing for in-app purchases. So um, what we do is uh, work with larger game publishers uh, using machine learning technology. We are able to real-time segment players that come in the game and then serve the right price at the right time, the right location. So we're serving, yeah, we, you know, and that's what we do. We do dynamic pricing. So our conversation here is not really about um, dynamic pricing, too. But instead, we want to talk about, because um, before I can even bother pricing a game, you know, you need to have a game that is something compelling, something you want to use. You have to have the right monetization hooks in place, you know, for that game. So um, we are going to talk about how to design your mobile game for optimal IEP. With that, I want to, so we're actually very, very fortunate here to have a, a great group of panelists. Um, I want to let them actually first just introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about, you know, some games you've worked on. Fauzi? Hello. Uh, my name is Fauzi. I'm the studio game design director here in uh, Berlin for King. Um, we are home of uh, Candy Crush Jelly Saga, as the uh, most uh, recent release. Hello, I'm Alex. Uh, I work at uh, Social Point as a head of product. So we are a Barcelona-based company. We are roughly 300 people. And we are known for uh, Dragon City, Monster Legend, and World Chef, which is the game I'm, I'm working on. And uh, in the news, uh, well, last week, we, we have had a big news. We have been acquired by Take-Two, the maker of uh, Grand Theft Auto, among other titles. Yeah, big news. Um, Reggie. Um, the uh, head of studio for Rovio in Stockholm. Uh, we work over that in the Angry Birds 2 titles. I uh, also worked on the other Angry Birds games uh, back in Finland uh, before. I mean, I've been in the industry for 17 years. It's going to take one hour to speak all of them, so I think that's enough. Okay, great. Um, first, um, you, know, you know, we make games because... We love games, right? That's clearly the case with all of you guys here. Um, certainly everyone out in the audience. But it's also a great way to make a lot of money, right? And so the, you know, in fact, according to Superdata, last, they came out last week with an announcement. They said, I uh, got $40 billion last year uh, in terms of revenue, an 18% increase from the year prior. It's half of, you know, all digital game sales. You know, in fact, it's actually 40 billion is the same as total movie box office uh, um, from last year too, so obviously phenomenal, amazing, you know, opportunity. But you know, but let's start, you know, let's let's start with saying fundamental, right? You know, so the you know, top 100 games, you know, they're all f for for most part free to play, IEP business model, other than Minecraft and Pokemon Go. But let's, you know, is that as is that for here to stay? Do we think the IEP business model is um, for the long term, next five years? Um, I definitely think that it's uh, it's here to stay. Like um, um, it's it's been very successful um, for, for mobile space, but it was also a free to play model has been applied to a lot of other genres, and uh, they've been seeing a lot of success uh, in that as well. Um, free to play, uh, it might like right now it's not that new in the West, but like it's been also um, a common uh, way to monetize game in Asia for a long, long time, and it's still been proving very successful. So yeah, definitely here to stay. I'd say. Yeah, I, I think from the from the user's pr perspective, you no, know, it has been interiorized that now uh, things should be free, and then if you if you're having a good time uh, or enjoying what you see and, and, and the, the game, then it's okay to to spend two bucks or, or more or more into that. I, I, I'm sure it will evolve over time, no? But uh, as far as I know, this is the only business model that allows so much flexibility in terms of the offer you can provide to, to your users. No, you, you are able to provide something for, for a little engaged user who wants to spend only two bucks in your game, or for the power user who, who's really enjoying and who will end up spending hundreds of thousands in your game. And I don't think of any other business model that allows that, that amplitude. Yeah, I totally follow Alex on this one. Um, as long as people like things for free, uh, this business model is going to stay. Um, we're going to see some other um, things coming on that's going to probably uh, leave uh, alongside with uh, free-to-play, but I don't expect it to go anywhere anytime soon. So even um, other platforms are more and more adopting free-to-play. Um, definitely here to stay in the next five years at least. So is 
Reg, is premium, is it dead as a business model? Uh, in mobile, it's pretty much dead by now, right? Yeah. Um, I'm waiting to see uh, disruptive technologies and see if they can also bring new business models. Mm -hmm. But so far, uh, I wouldn't advise investing in premium. Okay. All right, so IP, phenomenal business opportunity, um, revenue driver, but, you know, I care, care from everyone on this uh, matter, too. So first things first is, you know, we got to make games you like. So I like to, I guess, first starting with Fauci, is, you know, tell us about a game that um, you thought was just great and perfectly designed for IEP and why? Um, I guess I could start with like um, recent phenomena. I really like the in-app uh, purchase of design in uh, Pokemon Go. Um, it's just that I think it, uh, it, uh, it worked on mechanics that kind of like what I buy for myself can kind of benefit other people around me. So there's this added um, social benefit of um, spending in-game that kind of feels good even though if you, you get in-game benefits but you also get um, social benefits which is really one of the pillars that the game was designed around. Um, I thought that was um, a clever um, kind of new way in designing things. Um, it kind of reminds me of some um, uh, um, free-to-play design mechanics they used to apply in some free, um, uh, Korean MMOs back in the day. Where just like a bomb explodes and everybody around that bomb gets stuff. And that was always like one of the top-selling items. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Alex? They have been improving over time because at the beginning it was uh, rather shallow, but now they, they have pimped it up. Yeah. Uh, the game I'm playing right now is Marvel Contest of Champions from uh, from Kabam. I don't know if you if you know it. It's basically a combat slash RPG game in which the, the goal is to uh, to get a maximum of superheroes and uh, and upgrade them. And uh, they have a very very complex economy which is very fragmented, which allow them to to have plenty of game modes. Uh, which is a dream for a designer because you have plenty of uh, bullets to, to apply friction uh, where you want. Uh, if on top of that you add a, a strong peer pressure through, through social layer and uh, one of the best IPs in the world, you have a, you have a winner. So it's, it's definitely worth checking this one. Yeah, I would bring Clash of Clans. Um, everybody knows it here, of course. But if you think about what makes a uh, free-to-play game a good free-to-play game for IEP, I believe Clash of Clans ticks all the boxes. So it's a game that doesn't depend a lot on new content. So you don't really have to have a huge team behind you creating uh, new items uh, for the game. Sometimes some games need like 40 artists just to keep up to date or up to the speed of the players that are consuming the content of the game. So Clash of Clans doesn't have it. Um, it is heavily social, meaning that every time you face a new battle, you're facing a base that was designed by a human. Therefore, it's a different challenge all the time, right? So the game doesn't become repetitive. And for a free-to-play or an IP-heavy game to succeed, it needs to be relevant for a long, long time, right? And in order to be relevant, it needs to keep being fun to play and not super repetitive all the time. And also, maybe even the most important part, um, they don't sell items in the game. They sell time. So the game is designed in a way that you can wait if you want, but if you want to be faster, you, you have to pay. But if you devoted or invested a long time in a game for a long period of time, you're going to be as powerful as somebody that invested a lot of money. Uh, and that makes the game feel fair to the player, and that's super important. And, and generally speaking, basing games on systems rather than content is always good for the development team. Well, this is what Clash of Clans did with the, with the clan thingy, which is players applying pressure on, on other players. In some other games like Pokemon or even our game Dragon City and Monster Legend, we are heavily dependent on the new content we release, which is a blessing, but also implies uh, that we release new content periodically, because, and also that we find ways to sync this new content into, into systems and features. Because if we don't, then we, we stop monetizing. So it's a challenge for content-based games. So conversely, so those are games that are, you know, did it right or well-designed that you're impressed with. So conversely, can you, you know, and we'll start with you, Reggie, kind of come back as, and because remember we were talking about this, I think, the other day, um, is can you think of a game that you just thought was great, um, but somehow just missed, you know, in terms of IEP, and in particular if you even had some thoughts on maybe how they could have done better you know, for that? 
Yeah, I, I can actually bring a game that I, I was directly working at. Um, it's a sword fighting game. I won't. I don't think I should name the game for the sake of the company, but it's not Rovio, by the way. Um, but this game was groundbreaking in many ways. It was the first, you know, trip away uh, mobile experience offered for free on a mobile device. And that was huge, right? But uh, back in the days, I didn't know a lot what I was doing, being honest with you guys. Um, and then we made a game that heavily uh, dependent on skill of the player. And then it's super hard to monetize this, right? The moment you pay to have a, a match on a game that depends on skill, the, the game becomes pay to win. So the guy that, you know, it's not as good of a player as you are, but has more money, he's going to play with you on the same grounds or even with an advantage. Um, and we made that, and that was uh, a big mistake, I would say. The game was highly successful because, uh, in a way, because of the novelty of the offer, so trip away experience for free. But um, if we uh, we have thought better, and if I have done this game now, uh, I would definitely make it in a very different way. Alex, and this is why games like uh, Clash Royale are brilliant, no? Because they rely partly on skill. But your skill is constantly challenged by the fact that you unlock new units, which force you to, to rethink your whole strategy, you know? and this is why it, it keeps working uh, over time. Uh, well, I had Pokemon Go, actually, so. <laughs> um, but it's been, it's been evolving over time, but it's true that, I mean, it can sound cocky, you know, because everyone would love to have a Pokemon Go in, in, in his portfolio. Uh, but at the beginning, it was very shallow, and, and, it, um, and it showed that they didn't really think about the whole, all the, the possibilities they had with, with, the, with, the, with the IP and the RPG part of, uh, of chasing the Pokemons. No, now they, they have been evolving over time, uh, but at the beginning it was, it was very shallow. Yeah, for me, it's a, it's a game that I kind of quite, really, really like and enjoyed, but um, I feel like they kind of missed out on the monetization part. It's called um, Rayman Adventures. Uh, by Ubisoft, um, it, it kind of follows the the Rayman Jungle Fiesta style of game. With both of these games, when they launched, were premium games. Um, uh, Rayman Adventures was a free-to-play game, and it really um, uh, delivered the Rayman experience on the phone. Um, but for the most part, the the, the in-app uh, purchases part of it felt like an afterthought. Like you could really play a lot of that game uh, without ever spending. Um, any amount of money. There wasn't any really any monetization opportunities presented within the game. Uh, it's a shame because it's a, a really well-made game that uh, not a lot of people have played, I feel. Okay. So, you know, thinking it's more like tactical level is, you, know, you guys are all you know, heads of studios for you know, working some pretty awesome monster games. Um, I'd like to hear from each one of you. Give, give us the audience so you, your list of you know, do's and don'ts when you're setting out and designing an IP-oriented game. Yeah, Reggie, you want to Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to bring back again the sword fight fighting game that I've, I've worked on. Uh, we had a sword that was $500. And people actually bought it. We had like a couple of people like, at least buying every day, and that number was growing over time. And we were extremely happy with that. We actually, in some days, we would make a, an offer or like slashing the price by 70% or so, and we would have like a huge spike in revenue in that date. And that was a really, really big mistake. You should never do that. Because that sword was so powerful that you can pretty much, you could pretty much end the game with that. Meaning uh, you didn't need to buy anything else in the game. So what we did effectively is that we kept the maximum revenue that we could receive from one player at $500. And who knows how many players were willing to spend a thousand or like ten thousand? I would bet a bunch. Right? So that's a common uh, no no that we have at Rovio. Don't sell one item that even even though it's super expensive, it's gonna end the game for your player. Because not only he won't have reasons to spend anymore, but also he will churn because he will finish your game. Right? Um, another very important thing is uh, we try, uh, we uh, as, as Rovio as a company, to have our games more and more social because uh, 
it's, it gives the players more opportunity to interact with other individuals and also keeps the gameplay much more um, you know, fresh to the player over time. And also it allows you to update or bring and change the game over time uh, without the necessity of a binary submission. And it, that's a pretty big advantage. Um, so I would start with those two. If I have time, I comment more. Yeah, um, at, at an even more macro level, for me, one very important thing, and I think it's a rookie mistake that we all did, is not thinking of monetization uh, from the very, very beginning of your development, uh, actually from the vision stage, or, or at the very least uh, during the pre-prod. If, if you are not capable of writing down how you will put frictions on your players, how will different segments of your users will behave, the very engaged versus the not that engaged, the big players versus the small players. Uh, if you are not capable of, of comparing these friction points with, with what the competition is doing, if you are entering into a competitive market, uh, then perhaps your idea is not that good, no? Uh, or perhaps you lack the, the internal skill to, to make a healthy business with, with these ideas. Uh, and this is actually, uh, I mean, three, four years ago, the, the market was much easier, but now production costs are, are becoming huge, user acquisition costs are becoming huge. So this is the typical rookie mistake that, uh, that, that you can no longer, no longer do. Um, and the, the, thick, the second one I had in mind was that perhaps l less is more no, when it comes to monetizing and that you, you shouldn't try to, to make money out of every system of your game. And sometimes being generous in some aspects uh, has an indirect uh, beneficial effect on monetization. Uh, for example, I'm playing this game from Playrix Township, uh, which is basically a crafting slash city building uh, game. Uh, they are very overly generous on gold. You become vi rich very, very fast. You can buy everything and it's super cool. No? It, it feels very satisfying. It, it, it increases the session length because you can literally spend one hour uh, in the game, like decorating and buying, uh, customizing your city. So you, you build a link between yourself and the game. Uh, but when it comes to, to having more commodities, having a bigger storage, expanding your land, then they are very hardcore and very strict. Uh, and this is how they monetize it. And I think it's good to define your philosophy. What is your North Star in terms of, uh, of balancing, uh, and, and to stick to it. Um, I'm a big uh, fan of uh, fairness when it comes to uh, in-app uh, purchases. Um, so ideally, like when designing the experience, we should be designing an experience that can be um, uh, enjoyed by both our paying customers and non-paying customers alike. Um, the, the player should get some kind of fun and not be hit with a, a very obvious paywall that would require them to, to play to continue. So I'm always a fan of this kind of uh, monetization design when it comes to mechanically. Um, but I also, um, uh, usually I'm also a fan of thinking of putting yourself in the shoes of the paying player and thinking like how does this um, mechanic or monetizing this particular experience um, enhances the experience of the, of the player in general. So um, if, that, if, uh, if that will remove the challenge, let's say, of a certain feature of the game, then that is actually doing more harm than good, even though um, you get some short-term uh, gains. And on that note, um, I would urge uh, a lot of the designers I work with, and myself included sometimes, to avoid um, uh, selling uh, permanent gains, especially early on. It seems to like these uh, permanent gains or buffs, um, those are one-time uh, purchase that uh, uh, you're going to have to deal with for the rest of the, the, the life of the game as it goes forward. And in some cases, games, uh, they could go on for three more years live, so... Uh, I'd urge people to think uh, long term when it comes to introducing monetization opportunities within their games. Do these changes change at all when you're working with, say, you know, kids' games? Um, our games don't target yeah. uh, kids per se, but I have uh, worked on kids' games uh, in the past, and uh, definitely um, we need to think about how. Um, like, you know, a target audience and not to exploit that particular target audience, especially if they are mostly kids, but we mostly, like, um, have informed um, in our purchases that um, have some kind of parental control and stuff like that. Um, but um, currently our games don't target uh, right. kids specifically. Can I can I add a little bit on top of what I said before? Yeah, yeah? please. We have time? Yeah, we do. Okay. So 
The, the other thing that I strongly recommend is always pay attention to the content thread mill. I know we mentioned that before, uh, Alex know this pretty closely, but you have to take that in consideration when, at least when you're in pre-production. So normally the art team, they're very proud of their work and they want to make a game that's really beautiful, um, but they also need to make sure that the game is a good business and they need to be super careful on how much content you have to create in your game and how expensive it is to do. Because, uh, and that has severe implications on not only on the art style, the technology that you choose, but also on the pipeline that you define how to create, uh, create asset. Because your goal is to, is to work on this game forever, pretty much, if you're lucky. But if you're, if you're really lucky, you're gonna be working on this game for five years. Uh, that, that, that's the goal. So you can save a lot of money and trouble by being mindful on you know, how content is created in your game. The, uh, and then the do's that we always try to do is uh, add an element of luck and an element of loss aversion in your game. Those are very, very powerful tools for monetization. Um, another question, so actually it's kind of similar to what we were talking a while back there, Alex, was uh, about, you know, be curious to hearing about your thoughts on like a, a change you led. So maybe it was a game that you launched and it was not so IAP oriented and, you know, maybe give us an example of a change that you led in terms of revisiting a game and retuning the, the monetization. Well, rather than big change, it's, it's uh, constant learnings, no? Uh, for example, on my game, World Chef, uh, initially, uh, we thought that we, we should monetize and, and, and put a high pressure on, on decorating your restaurant. Uh, we, 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 didn't, we had not figured that buying a, a piano for your restaurant was not as aspirational as unlocking a super cool monster in, in Monster Legend. No? So, so we priced that very high and we, and we saw very, uh, very shitty conversion on, on, uh, on those items. Uh, on the other hand, last week actually, we tried to associate decoration to normal, regular in a purchase pack, and we saw that uh, we would sell more hard currencies when associated with a decoration. So the decoration itself uh, was not a monetization driver, but it was a purchase driver, and it was a very interesting, uh, interesting learning. And we saw that it didn't cannibalize the regular purchase. So people would actually buy this pack because of the decoration, even though when in the game they would spend, they would not spend their, their hard currencies into decoration. This is the kind of learning you, you do on the way. No? So, who played Angry Birds here? Good. Who played Angry Birds 2? Good. So, when we released Angry Birds 2, uh, we were very happy. We had a lot of love from Apple, from Google. We got a lot of high spike in the AU. Um, our monetization was okay. That's good. Um, we were, I have to confess, heavily inspired by King um, in a good way. So and a lot of people is, actually. We are all doing uh, saga maps when it comes to casual games uh, just because you guys figured it out. To be honest. And what we figure out is that focusing on the saga map for Angry Birds 2 is actually not ideal. It's not the optimal solution. We took a step back and asked our players and asked, asked ourselves what our players really, really liked and cared about this game. And they actually cared about the birds. They didn't care so much about what level they were, they were in the progression of the game, if they were in the, the map a hundred or a thousand, that, that was all right, but what they really, really care was how more interesting, more powerful, and more you know, different or evolving their birds are becoming. And then we, we refocused the game completely um, to that direction, in a, to a point that we added uh, different ways of playing the game outside of the Sega map, and we played heavily with loss aversion and with multiplayer. And by doing that, uh, we, and also with gacha mechanics, we increased our average, uh, our pool, by threefold. 
in the course of one year. We increased the retention, and um, I have to say we're much happier with the game now than ever before. And stay tuned. If you play the game in two days, we're going to see a major change in the game. So, cool. Hank Cliffy moment. Sorry? Hank Cliffy moment. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that cliffhanger. Um, but Fausti, any like, what, you know, how do you think about when you're resetting a monetization or what signals are there for you that when you think you have to reset a monetization a game versus just maybe give up and, and move? Um, uh, we're uh, we're not we're not really in the, in the case of giving up on a product and moving on. It's more of like having a constant conversation with our audience, um, whether that conversation is directly driven between the two of us or um, what we can read in their behaviors, and. Um, uh, in terms of like uh, mo uh, monitoring, like um, what, what is uh, what is the things that uh, our audiences are reacting towards positively, and um, what are the things that will um, drive engagement towards that product even further? Even for uh, products that don't perform as well as others, we view these as um, um, uh, an, an interesting way to um, experiment with ideas without impacting some of our biggest titles. Um, so that we can uh, try out some stuff, see, gauge how our audience um, react there, and then maybe uh, le take learnings from that. So we're always learning um, from uh, what, what people tell us, basically. Okay. So then, continuing that thought is, you know, metrics, right? So then, what for you know, what metrics then are very important for you to kind of get an idea that what's working for you, or what do you look at to determine whether a game is success? Um, the, the biggest metric, I guess, for us is retention. It's always, it's always um, how much we're retaining our audience, uh, how people are coming back and playing that game more and more. Um, it's our biggest um, KPI measurement for success. When it comes to, to monetization, I, I think virtually every metric is interesting when you look at it with the payer filter on and off, because you learn things about the, the behavior of, uh, of your payers. Um, f for me, the, the key metric, I mean, con uh, conversion is kind of a vanity metric. No, it's kind of, I mean, we um, just measures your ability to, to generate lo love at, at first sight. In terms of, when it comes to monetization, I think <laughs> what's really important for you as a developer is your capacity to reawaken payers, so the, the rate of repeated purchases. This is, in the end of the day, in a business in which 5% of your people will end up giving you money, this is what matters, no? Out of those payers, how much how much will you get? This is what, what will be your, your lifetime value. So, so for me, this is the, the most important one. We were in a, I'm gonna tell a brief story, one second. We were in a workshop uh, at Rovio last week, and we coined one word, uh, ambitious. That's what we want to be. We want to be humble and ambitious at the same time. Um, but our ambition is really high. So in order to fulfill that ambition, we know that we can't have a hundred games in our portfolio. We, we have to do fewer games, but really, really successful ones that can scale. So our games, they need to scale. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for us to work on them. Um, in order for them to scale, we need to be able to buy players uh, profitably. So the CPIs, they, uh, the cost to install, uh, to, to acquire the players, they, they determine the major KPIs of our game. So we start with the LTV. So we, we don't even start thinking on a game if we don't think we can um, acquire players at scale, so the LTV is the major KPI that we analyze to start with. Um, but if you want to go a little bit down one level, then of course we look at retention, um, we look at the, uh, you know, ARPU very often, but mostly what we have learned is that if you really want to understand the econ economy of your game, you have to look at the gems, the hard currency. So you have to look at the, the flow of hard currency inside your game. So how much coins you have or how much uh, gems you have in circulation, how fast your players are buying them, what are they using, in what features they are using, so you have an X-ray of your game, so what really matters to your players. Uh, when you look at these very carefully, and we actually plan, 
we want our players to spend money on OGMs in this feature more because we believe uh, the, this has a, a longer tail, right? And we look at the, uh, yeah, I think that that's the, the most important uh, KPI that we look at when it comes to monetization. Yeah, one metric we have uh, in, in the to follow on what you say is the first purchase done in the game right after uh, an in-game purchase is done. I mean, what do the players who actually became players use the the gems they bought they bought for? So what's right after? Yeah. So it's it's a good learning usually. So you mentioned retention, ARPU. Yeah. You know, I mean, what do you have any specific? number, you know, retention numbers you like to see, let's say games in soft launch, and you're trying to sort of figure out whether you want to go for global launch, do you have specific targets that you aim for before making that go, no go? Because yeah, mark, you know, games are expensive to create, mm -hmm. marketing it probably two times that, right? Yeah, it depends a bit on the genre, to be honest. Uh, what we have learned is that there are games like uh, Game of War, for instance, that have horrible uh, 30 day retention. I've, I've, I've heard some rumors that around like 2 or 3 percent. And they are making a lot of money. So we, we acknowledge that we don't know uh, everything about all the genres. For the genres that we, we are more used to, we, we follow the, the standard of the industry, the uh, 40, 20, 20, 10, which is a 40 day, uh, 40 percent uh, D1, uh, 20 percent uh, D7 and 10% uh, D30, right? That's kind of the standard of the industry. Uh, normally when uh, when we start the game, we set our targets a bit higher. We Some of the games in soft launch that we have over there, they actually uh, have better uh, numbers. So I think I shouldn't even have comment on that, but I'm going to stop here. <laughs> yeah. So... Another yeah question like what um, what maybe what monetization trends was, you know, Alex have you saw maybe in the last year um, that you thought were interesting that you thought you know you're looking at any new ideas monetization trends? I like the um, the subscription system that Boom Beach released one month ago, Boom Beach from Supercell, mm -hmm. which basically for two ninety nine per per month you have an extra walker. Uh, for those who didn't play the game. The walker is the slim, streamline of work, and you can build only one thing at the time. So it's a huge commodity uh, to, to to buy the, this new this new walker, and, and I think it will stick and it will work for them. It's not for, it's not new. Uh, some games did that before, like Heroes Charge, like a couple of years ago. But what Heroes Charge wa was doing was giving you free gems every day. Uh, so it was half retention, half monetization feature because you would have to. To, to opt in every day to get the gems that you paid for. Uh, I feel more comfortable in associating this monthly payment to a, a commodity rather than to real, real, real hard currency because I, I think there is a risk of cannibalization. It's not backed up with data, it's just gut yeah. feeling, no? Well, no, I'm glad you brought up uh, subscriptions because I actually wanted to ask, but you know, we've been talking about you know, IEP over here too, but you know, obviously you know, last year, I'm just not sure exactly what it means, but Apple announced you know, subscriptions, and so I'm curious if anyone else had any further thoughts on subscriptions in the model and how it plays. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think subscriptions are going to replace IAPs, yeah. right? but they will coexist. Or they work together. They will work together, fulfilling, fulfilling different purposes. So subscriptions actually works pretty well for retention, I think. And uh, I think we're going to see a lot of games using them for VIP systems that, as you described, is going to give you uh, a little bit of advantage in the game, but not enough for you to be able to beat the game completely, right? So I would see that designers would start designing the uh, the average, uh, the economy of the game, considering that people will have subscription in mind. Fauci, any new ideas, trends you saw that you think are interesting regarding monetization? Um, <laughs> um, there might be um, a little bit um, uh, of a bias here just because I have some background working in the Japanese market, but I've always been an advocate for the gacha mechanic. And um, in the recent uh, couple of years, we started to see them like doing really um, strong trending in the Western markets. It's performing really, really well in some of the games. Um, Clash Royale, one of them. Um, uh, uh, Fallout Shelter is another example, Hearthstone as well. Um, so um, the concept of gacha has been presented to the Western audience and it's been uh, performing really well. So with that, um, I can see more companies benefiting from that aspect and introducing it to their games. 
um, in a good manner. And on the, on the topic of subscription, one of, uh, one monetization techniques that some Japanese games used to apply is that, um, um, it's a monthly fee, basically like the subscription, but in which you get a certain amount of um, hard currency every day. So you basically have one big lump sum uh, purchase, which is trickle down on a daily basis to kind of control your spending on some of the games. Um, I haven't seen that make the transition to the West yet, but um, there could be um, some companies that will take advantage of that. One thing a lot of Asian games do too is uh, having VIP programs for, for their players as, to, as soon as you stop Paying basically, you enter into the fidelity program that unlocks new content, and it's even something you can brag about uh, because there are leaderboards of the best players, which is obviously not uh, suited for all categories and all audiences. But in some very specific ultra competitive games, this should foster uh, increasing monetization. Oh, yeah, actually, so another one that we started seeing that kind of recently, also more common in the East, is uh, annuities. And so the idea of just, does everyone know what an annuity is? Yeah. Okay. So just basically the idea of being able to buy a fixed amount of virtual currency at a very steep discount and then having it um, delivered over a, a period of time, a fixed period of time. So, um, so it, yeah, we're seeing that as, we think that actually could be a really good trend, um, particularly for, just appeals to totally different uh, type of player behavior, right? So mm -hmm. like most... Let's say, let's say, most splash screens, everything else is kind of geared around, you know, impulse buy, right? You know, get some engaged and then buy now and then, okay, yes, I'm going to buy, right? But this appeals nicely to people who are more of a, a planner you know, type in terms of purchases. Just about trends, and perhaps this is going back backwards in the question, but it's good to know trends. Uh, it's also very important to understand uh, what systems fits your game better and not try to apply blindly. Uh, everything that you see in the competition. Uh, one typical example is the, the starter pack, no? which is the thing you get between day one and day three that's offer, that offers a massive discount of hard currency plus plenty of items and supposedly will make your first two weeks of game uh, easier. Uh, it can be a false good idea because you, you will see as soon as you put a starter pack in your game an increase in conversion, but then uh, perhaps after 30 days or you will see a decrease in, in lifetime value. And there is a twist. Uh, both platforms also behave differently. For example, we just put a starter pack in, in WarChef. The impact was beneficial on the LTV for iOS users, but there was a lot of cannibalization for, for Android users. So if you don't have the, the analytic structure to, to test uh, and to understand what's happening in your game, don't go and apply blindly what you see uh, as best practices from the competition. Uh, still on the gacha subject, uh, there are different, yeah, there's so many ways of doing gacha, and here in the West, we pretty much only apply one kind of gacha, um, but there are at least 10 different kinds, and I think it's just a matter of time until we start to see this moving from the East to the West as well, so we are going to use different, I know, uh, strategies to do gacha. One of my favorites is the, the box gacha which is you have, let's say, an option of 10 different items that you can get. Every time you, you spin the wheel, uh, you, you get one of those items, and then if you spin again, that item that you got, it's not available for you anymore. So you have the, the nine other options. And eventually, that super, super rare item that's over there, if you spin 10 times, you're going to get it. Right? Uh, we don't explore this kind of ideas a, a lot yet, but this is huge in Asia, and I think it's come it's eventually it's going to make it to the east, west as well. Cool. So, so um, one of the things we hear a lot when we to be on new partners is because you know we're we're changing prices. Is is the concern that you know players talk, you know, or communicate, right? So as your games have social connections and players communicate, does that come into how you price IEP at all, or how you think about monetization? I think the. The moment you manage to make this dynamic and players expect fluctuations in the price, yeah. they will be uh, fine with the idea of changing prices regularly. So it doesn't want to be a lot of uh, backslash from the community for that. Yeah, well, I mean, I was less, yeah, I, I think we hear that, but not, not necessarily seeing the different price changes, but I was curious if there's any sort of design considerations of just uh, a community-oriented game and how you have monetization. So I mean, some people, I mean, there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, Pay, pay versus effort, right? You know, in terms of getting to a certain level. I don't anyway. know how to comment on that. Okay. I'll be honest with you. 
Uh, hello. Uh, what do you think about um, uh, making price discrimination across markets? So basically spending one dollar in US for many people means nothing, but for example in whatever India or Pakistan it's quite a significant amount of money. Do you, do you uh, how to say, tune your prices for in our purchases uh, against uh, purchasing uh, the power of particular nations? Yeah. Can I start? Yeah. We do. Uh, we change prices uh, depending on the location um, and also some other um, vectors as well. And that's actually makes a, a huge difference right? for exactly the same reasons that you said. That said, uh, I think that is a lot more that we can do. And we're looking into our options and how we can make this, you know, price even more dynamic, even inside the same country. Yeah, well, Reggie is right. We, we don't do it, but this is one of the big topics for us uh, this year. And country is just one variable out of the thousands of variables that, that, that you can use. Uh, engagement level, whether they paid or didn't pay, high, high payers, low payer, I mean, all those things, so yeah. yeah I'll just echo what uh, those guys have said, basically, we're always uh, looking for new ways to engage with our audiences worldwide. Uh, yeah, I have a question to Reginaldo. I was uh, wondering, <laughs> yeah, in front, I was wondering um, how big is the f free to play revenue part of, of Rovio nowadays? So, how much of the revenue is coming from that? part of the business like it, more yeah. or less not exact but it is a very fair question so we 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 grew as a company back in the days of premium um, we are not a premium company anymore um, I won't be able to disclosure to you how much money we make from from premium games can we say sure. yeah so we can say it uh, we make a hundred percent of our IP revenue or for games revenues from from free-to-play games only. We don't make premium games anymore for a while. Uh, hi, so uh, I have a question uh, regarding to in-game currencies. Um, as I understand, uh, because you mentioned that you have soft currency and hard currency in your games, but uh, what do you think about uh, like economic systems with one currency, one universal currency, or uh, some games make uh, like mixed options when for example, some items, uh, so there's currency, but some expensive items, they sell directly for money. So what do you think about one currency to rule them all or mix it uh, options with currency and uh, direct money purchases? Thank you. Uh, I could probably take this one because um, we, uh, most of our games operate on one uh, hard currency and we do sell directly for um, uh, 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 cash and it's been working out really well for us in terms of one currency. It depends on your target audience too. Uh, again, in the case of Marvel Contest of Champion, they have a super complex economy with tons of currencies. Uh, I, makes, it, make, makes it easier to, to, to do live ops and offers, but I think every system can work if, 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 it, if your design is good, no? Yeah, I, I have the same opinion. I think it can work. Um, it feels to me it's a bit harder because it gives you less, you know, opportunities. Um, I'll give you an example. Many games nowadays they like to rely on having live events, like having tournaments. Um, you want to give the players uh, things like tokens or currency that can they can use only during that event. So it gives this time pressure and this sense of rarity as well. And it's, a, it's much, much more flexible because uh, you, you have much more room to make mistakes as well. So if you only have one currency in the game, you, you can't do many of those things. So it's harder. But it still can work. So how about um, rewarded video? Is that, um, how does that fit in with when you're designing an IEP-oriented game? Mm, I, can, I can take it. Uh, it does. Are they complement? They work together? I think it's uh, it's nowadays it's something that 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 players have gotten used to when, when it's done in a, in an elegant way, meaning it's when it's tied to a mechanic and that you actually have a, a real benefit uh, f from watching an, an ad. Um, of course, if you do it in your face, uh, very very intrusive, then it's not going to work. 
uh, and I'm uh, I'm a believer that if you plan to have a massive launch with featurings and big user acquisition campaign, then you should probably have video ads from from day one because uh, it can be uh, between 20 and 50 percent of extra revenues. So, uh, so it's a big one. It's it's a quick win basically. It might be a bit controversial for King, so I, I will sorry? spare you. It might be a bit controversial for King to comment on this one. <laughs> so I'm sorry, bad yeah. joke, but. <laughs> Uh, for for Brovio, it's actually uh, quite a big deal. It's a it's a good business for us. We uh, we think it can be really really good to monetize the players that don't want to spend money in your game. Regardless, the majority of the players they won't right spend money. So if you have ads in a game, and and there is a distinction of course between the interstitials and the incentivized videos. So. Actually, players want and they like it. We have seen at some moments that you can actually improve retention by including and adding ads to your game. Might feel counterintuitive, but in fact, it's not right. It's it's uh, you're giving the players a fair way to have access to uh, premium content in your game, and they they like it. The the, the tricky here is to plan this ahead of time. So you know exactly what you want to, you know, the players to spend gems on and what you can offer to the players uh, for free uh, watching ads. If you plan this ahead of time, they work very well together. Yeah, actually, it, it becomes part of the flow and part of the daily routine of the game to, to watch an ad and to get rewarded for that. And, and people actually embrace it uh, as, as soon as it's not intrusive, no? And uh, the only thing is that this is something that plays on volume. So if you have a low uh, user base or don't plan to make a lot of user acquisition, that probably you, you wouldn't have uh, too many benefits of uh, going fully ads. The other drawback is to base your economy only on video ads, like all those idle games and clickers, which are good, but are kind of shallow in, uh, in terms of, uh, of structure. And they live only with video ads, which, which works only during the featuring weeks, and then it, it's, it's hard to sustain a business with that only. Uh, yeah, for us, uh, we'll consider it uh, only if it makes sense for the game, and uh, if the rewards given also make sense for the game and has its stance, and, but, um, and if it makes sense for our players to engage with it. All right, we're out of time. I think they're getting a hook. It's going to pull us off, but um, thank you all very much for your time. really appreciate it. Thank you, and we hope you found it interesting. Thank you.